Hi, this is John Kanopoulos from our office here in Athens, Greece, the Laser Vision um, Ambulatory Surgery Center, clinical professor of ophthalmology at uh, NYU Medical School in New York City, New York. Here's a, a yesterday's case. This is the left eye of a lady I had done LASIK on uh, about 20 years ago. We can see here on the Optos uh, wide field that the left eye, which is on the right hand on our screen, as a dense cataract, and we, here we can see what's left behind from that uh, successful LASIK for about a minus 10. Uh, we can see the pentacam, slight decentration here on the pentacam. Uh, when we view a procedure performed 20 years ago today, we use the 5 millimeter total cornea measurements as uh, the means to calculate the keratometry with the current interferometry. These are the placebo dyslipographies also showing some nasal disintegration, uh, and also, of course, the um, interferometry by the Tomei device and uh, Lenstar. We, of course, will look at uh, endothelial cell counts, which are um, suggesting a Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, although the cornea thickness is relatively good. Our Lenstar measurements um, as well, uh, and we're focusing on left eye that has an actual length measurement of over 27 millimeters, and left-hand side here, we're looking at all the different keratometries. As I mentioned, we use the 5 millimeter total cornea case from the Pentacam. Uh, comes up with a toric lens. Uh, our go-to is to do a calculation as is with the lens star and add two doctors, similar numbers with the ACRS uh, post-LASIK protocol here with an average of 20-some uh, doctors. We want this eye to be myopic, so we aimed for a 21 lens with a toric Microsoft calculator. So this is uh, 92 degrees at uh, T3 at 92 degrees. We're starting the procedure. We had recommended this lady had cataract surgery five years ago in 2016. Nevertheless, she waited uh, for quite a while. And she is in his in her early 60s. She's only uh, 62 years old. So she was uh, almost 40 when she underwent LASIK. First problem here, small pupil. Uh, this is after vigorous uh, topical uh, midriatics, uh, rinsing off the surface. I always do surgery with uh, a short-term peribulbar anesthesia. lasts for about an hour. I use 5 cc of 2% xylocaine and uh, 5 cc of normal saline. And, of course, white ace. This lasts for about an hour. So during the procedure, the patient is doing well. Beveled incision here. Uh, always um, at the 135 degree mark in the uh, paracentesis. This is a right eye. I'm over the nose here with the same 275 uh, alcohol keratin, but only partially. To enter uh, in an under 1 millimeter paracentesis, we'll use uh, epinephrine here, diluted epinephrine, and we can see uh, we'll get a nice kick in the pupil uh, dilation. And uh, we still can't appreciate how uh, hard this lens is classically viscoat, especially in this hard lens. And I'm jumping into the part that I realize that I have a rent uh, at the uh, top left of the uh, image here, which is basically the 5 o'clock position. And this uh, is what this case will illustrate. What should we do at this point? Convert all of this into an extra cap. I will use viscoat to fill in that gap. Uh, the lens has not sank down a lot. So I am going to try, after making sure that the retina guy is stand by, to see how much of the lens I'll be able to emulsify. We're seeing that despite Fuchs, the cornea is relatively clear. I've used copious uh, visco during the uh, initial divide and conquer. The lens is um, already divided into four segments. And uh, I have a very stable, stable anterior chamber, especially now that I... Uh, filled uh, the uh, um, in infero, this is a left eye, so the infrotemporal rent with uh, the uh, with viscoelastic. A uh, few uh, moments here of uh, reflection and consideration, and uh, this part is uh, unedited, and I'd like to uh, show it to you as such. I'm going to use a Kuglin and a Sinsky to make sure I separate these uh, lens fragments very um, nicely. We can uh, we can all appreciate how dense this lens is and in retrospect maybe an extra cap here would have been a best solution but uh, we can also see how large 
uh, the lens has become and how rigid, is the, rigid these particles are. And we're constantly under the risk of uh, and the possibility that this lens may uh, at any point pop into the procedure chamber and may require a more laborious procedure. But nevertheless, um, I'm going to go forward since the, this quad is asking for me to uh, FACO it and I'm going to, um, and I apologize for this uh, image being a little bit off uh, camera, uh, to carefully emulsify uh, this uh, quad of the lens. It's the smallest one. You can see that uh, it's almost attached to the lens, the, the, the rest of the cataract. But I'm pretty successful in uh, chewing up with uh, my FACO device, and I use the uh, White Star signature device here. I'm with uh, uh, FACO power at uh, 40%, and here I uh, invited in some procedure capsule again. So we're going to reiterate uh, the uh, maneuver of uh, injecting some uh, uh, viscode into that rent opening. Uh, I'm contemplating here how much of the lens is left behind and whether I'll be able to open the incision and fish it out with a loop. Uh, still, this would be a very large incision. Remember, I'm at 2.7 in my major incision, and uh, I got away with one quad, so I will uh, attempt to, after uh, we get a, a second tube of uh, viscode ready, and we see it in action here, to uh, lift uh, the lens up a little bit from the uh, capsule, uh, push uh, a little bit of viscoelastic into that inferior rent to brave this out and to try and emulsify as much as possible as I can to at least bring it down to the point that I can uh, pull uh, the piece out. Um, I'm, you're gonna see me going back and forth quite a while. I know that uh, this video may be quite painful for some of you to watch. Uh, as uh, I'm now rotating uh, the residual lens in a way that, number one, I can pick it up with a uh, lens loop. Number two, I can try, I can endeavor into uh, uh, chewing up some of the loose ends, again, with uh, frequently breaking and uh, filling the uh, chamber with uh, visco to protect the uh, very, very, uh, sensitive uh, endothelium, as we saw that this lady has the beginning of uh, Fuchs and Hill dystrophy. I'm able to uh, pull in uh, this quad of the uh, divide and con conquered, well, divide not yet conquered uh, uh, cataract, so to speak. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. And uh, uh, very carefully, I've lowered the bottle so I have low pressure in the anterior chamber. I'm very careful to make sure that uh, no piece is uh, left loose and allowed to drop into the procedure chamber. We can all see uh, this round rent that extends uh, in our uh, surgeon's image super towards the left. And in essence, this is a infratemporal rent uh, of about uh, maybe 70, 90 degrees in arc. Uh, and at this point, um, I will um, proceed in uh, debulking as much as possible uh, this ferocious uh, nucleus. Um, only if I had uh, predicted that this lens, um, and you saw in the beginning that the red reflex was very deceiving, uh, we felt that this lens would be uh, maybe a three uh, or three and a half out of four being worse, or a four to five out of six being worse. Uh, but this uh, is a four plus uh, with four being worse and uh, uh, possibly five to six with six being worse so depending on which uh, classification you use. So I'm going to push back the procedure capsule. Um, we're very lucky we don't have any vitreous in the wound. We can see the very nice uh, continuous capsule rexes that's holding place and I'm already in my mind planning on using it to uh, put in MA Sokos lens. I've already asked uh, my nurse to calculate that. Um, and not only here, we have a uh, post LASIK uh, calculation with a goal of uh, minus one and a half, since this uh, uh, is going to be the myopic eye of the two. 
I am ha I'm having enough room to come in with a lens loop. I have almost half of the uh, cataract there, the nucleus. Uh, my opening is not big enough. I'm probably around five and a half millimeters, maybe six, but uh, this being half the lens and plus more will require a little bit bigger. Uh, very careful here to use my keratome in an angle such as to maintain that um, initial or maintain as much as possible that initial uh, beveled incision, uh, pickle incision uh, that would uh, require less uh, uh, suturing and obviously less astigmatism post-op. I'm engaging here the uh, uh, nucleus left behind and uh, we will deliver uh, this uh, very, very hard lens. I do not want to manipulate the uh, anterior chamber much, so I'm going to fish uh, this uh, rock hard nucleus uh, from the outside, keep it as a souvenir, and then uh, use viscoelastic to express. Uh, as you can see here, I don't have vitreous in my wound uh, yet, uh, but I'm already setting up an anterior retractor. And the one on the um, signature white star is an excellent one. Um, and here I'm using viscoelastic to express all the residual cortical, rather nuclear material that's left behind. We will uh, go back and remember our art of uh, extra cap, although this is kind of a converted extra cap with, uh, uh, with a incision of... Uh, about six millimeters, I'd say, so I can probably get away with two or three sutures. Our tenor nylon is uh, armed and uh, ready to go. Uh, we'll go in, and uh, this is very important, especially for beginning surgeons, to be very um, careful here and very um, thorough and uh, try and suture this in a way that um, we will not create a step uh, in the cornea and the um, limbus grasp part of the clear cornea that's under this beveled cornea incision, go through the sclera, um, and uh, this way have a very good seal in the beveled cornea incision. I have to go through conj at some point. This is, um, at this point, a little elusive. I opted not to create a pyridomy at this point. I was able to go through with my 10 nylon um, needle and um, throw in a square, three square knots here, and uh, then um, explore the uh, anterior vitrectomy uh, pathway, which uh, again, we have to be very thorough. We want to debulk uh, the uh, anterior vitreous, um, create a scenario where this uh, case uh, that uh, is quite challenging will end up uh, as a normal phaco case. And, uh, time here is not of essence, although my average case, and I'm a relatively slow uh, phaco surgeon, uh, since I like to do every step of the procedure, is anywhere between 10 and 12 uh, minutes, we will spend a good half hour in trying to uh, make this look uh, not only good, but uh, explore the best possible visual outcome. As I mentioned prior to this, um, the astigmatism uh, for the T3 was um, uh, with the rule, and this is why I uh, opted to run with the enlargement of my incision towards the steep axis of uh, the um, planned toric lens and use my incision as the means that will reduce the cornea astigmatism post-op. Uh, as we know that when I remove my sutures, the wound will relax a little bit and reduce that uh, uh, with uh, the rule of astigmatism. I am using my IA here. Um, and uh, I'm very ambitious that this will not uh, pull in vitreous. Um, and, of, of course, I've lowered the bottle of the um, uh, White Star um, signature device. I'm uh, very good in getting away and removing uh, cortex. And remember, leaving cortex behind here may be the worst thing of anything, uh, even worse than the uh, uh, capsule rent. I will fill in uh, again the opening with viscoelastic. There's always a uh, golden medium on how much uh, manipulation I will do with irrigation aspiration and when will I jump in with my vitrector. I'm trying to get away 
and removing as much as cortex as possible since uh, uh, this coat is uh, acting as a nice seal uh, and not allowing my water to go through the uh, uh, rent uh, and uh, at some point I will give up I'll jump in with the um, extractor device very high uh, cut rate um, 800 to a thousand and this is one of the nice perks with the um, signature white star device uh, it has been our go to go to device for at least uh, five years now and you can kind of see me somewhere there down there on the uh, picture in picture uh, I use a dark room so everything seems quite dark uh, in the OR room we're setting up the um, uh, vitrectomy uh, mode and this device and uh, we will go in with um, irrigation and vitrectomy to um, debulk the uh, anterior vitreous and here we go and as I mentioned before I'm running this uh, real time uh, in order for us to also appreciate the uh, uh, real intraoperative uh, environment uh, and how uh, these things um, run I want to make sure that my um, vitrectomy probe is um, functioning well so I will uh, test drive it a few times. I do not want to go in with just aspiration. I want to make sure that the cutting rate is at par and uh, at the level that I like. And as soon as I, uh, I'm convinced that uh, my vitrector is up and running, I will engage it through my paracentesis and uh, just go through the rent uh, into the anterior vitreous uh, cavity and uh, just uh, start debulking. Uh, the now hydrated uh, uh, vitreous uh, material and uh, reduce the possibility of a prolapse. I'm spending a little bit of time here and I'm quite thorough in uh, removing as much as uh, vitreous material also you can kind of see uh, all the myopic imperfections uh, that are present probably viscoelastic as well uh, in the posterior cavity uh, being very nicely vitrectomized with my probe I'm using my second hand my right hand through the initial incision for irrigation the bottle is very low and now I'm cutting my um, uh, cutting rate to zero I'm going to use my vitrectomy probe as an irrigator aspirator to uh, complete uh, the uh, removal of the cortex. As I mentioned, this is a very critical part of a successful procedure that we have converted into uh, a mini extra cap uh, anterior vitrectomy. So we'll use a viscoelastic again to uh, fill in the capsule bag. Uh, we will go in with um, irrigation aspiration. Uh, we don't have any vitreous prolapse here, so there will be no pressure of material coming in from the uh, rent. And see how things become far easier now. Uh, it's as if I'm it's as if I'm performing an IA in an I with a complete uh, capsule bag. So I am. Uh, engaging the uh, cortex uh, I'm very pleased that uh, I'm uh, seeing less and less cortex and more and more a clear capsule bag and uh, through this whole uh, small adventure I'm preserving a very nice anterior capsule ring as a uh, scaffold to uh, place the Sokos uh, three-piece lens which we have already uh, calculated to include the fact that it's going to be placed more anterior and we're going to take out one diopter of what we would have uh, calculated that lens to be if it was placed in the capsule bag. Now with the lens that we use this is going to be an uh, MA Acrosoft lens and uh, it does not have uh, the option of astigmatism and this is the reason as I mentioned before that I uh, enlarged my incision towards the steep axis that this uh, patient had prior. Here's our lens. It's um, a MA 
60 lens uh, power 21. It's a three piece um, hydrophobic, hydrophobic acrylic lens. Uh, I do not have to enlarge the incision further because I will fold the lens and uh, it will comfortably uh, go through the uh, quite large incision that I have, even with the one suture. Uh, I think one side has at least four millimeters. Nevertheless, uh, for better control of uh, implantation, uh, we will fold the lens, orient the haptics uh, uh, in uh, the direction of favor. Again, very careful here in um, coming in uh, just uh, flush with the um, pupillary aperture. We're not seeing it well here and definitely over the um, anterior capture rexus. Uh, let the lens unfold gently and then um, use uh, a Kuglin or a Sinsky. Started with uh, thought on the Sinsky, converted to the Kuglin to engage the uh, edge of the lens, uh, and then use my toothless forceps to grasp uh, the uh, trailing haptic and uh, come in and place it right flush under the iris. Uh, it did engage part of the uh, pupillary aperture here. And I will use my uh, Kuglin hook to uh, complete the implantation onto uh, the anterior capsule. But uh, as you can see here, I have some uh, lens capture under the anterior capsule that I will come and correct with my Sinsky hook and bring it over. So that way, my uh, MA lens is sitting over the anterior capsule and within the sulcus. I have very good support. Um, I will go in and complete the irrigation aspiration, which will um, make me aware that there's a, a, a very tiny thread of uh, uh, vitreous uh, present that will uh, again uh, make me come in back with my vitrector and uh, make sure that uh, I am um, using uh, acetylcholine here um, to attain uh, meiosis. And make sure that uh, my pupil closes and also help me uh, to realize if there's uh, any vitreous uh, band engaged especially in using my uh, Sinsky hook to um, massage the uh, pupil and make the pupillary aperture smaller and um, I will soon soon realize that uh, I do have a tiny vitreous uh, band uh, protruding through my pupillary aperture. I will complete the suturing of uh, this uh, clear cornea incision uh, very carefully. Uh, I will end up with uh, three interrupted uh, tenon nylon sutures that I will start removing uh, the earliest at one month and uh, uh, tapering them according to uh, my keratometry in order to use then this incision as my modulary for my modulary to modulary tool rather for a correcting astigmatism. So we're taking here a uh, mishap, a small complication to uh, unfold uh, all the knowledge from extra cap, uh, keratometry, cornea astigmatism, uh, square sutures a must here, and uh, we're bearing the knots. Uh, always uh, patient com comfort comes first, uh, filling in the chamber, the lens is sitting very well. And uh, we have a uh, finished procedure. I think what I'll do here is I'm just going to replace the first suture that I placed at the 12 o'clock position because it's quite loose. Uh, and they won't do the job that we want. Remember that if uh, we suture loosely heal, um, rather, if we suture loosely, the healing will cause much more astigmatism than we would expect. So incision of this arc should correct about a diopter and a half, max two diopters of astigmatism. And uh, that will be uh, just fine uh, with um, what we want to correct as a residual uh, cornea astigmatism left from her original LASIK procedure. So we're at the fi finishing uh, touches here. Uh, more uh, acetylcholine, we're filling in the chamber. We have no uh, vitreous bands uh, protruding. 
double checking our wound, it's watertight, our brass and pieces. And I think it's time to call it a day. We unfortunately ran into a half hour procedure instead of uh, 10 to 12 minutes, but uh, the take home message here is that we have to invest the time. Uh, so next day we have a, a patient that has vision of 2040 with some cornea edema. Remember this patient had Fuchs pre-op uh, and besides all the mishaps, uh, we have a very good results. This is John Calapo signing out. Thanks so much for your attention.